Thank you for your love, Jesus. Thank you for coming and dying for us. Thank you for your freedom in this place this morning. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all God bless you. Thank you. Always feel welcome here. Always feel like I'm coming home. I'm a Mississippi boy, uh, just from up the road. We drove from Hattiesburg this morning. Uh, so this is my home place. Uh, please don't tell Pastor Larry Stocks to of Bethany World Prayer Center that it's my favorite church, but <laughs> cut that off the tape. But I love coming here, and uh, thank you. I'm looking forward to the day, though, when you don't honor me as a guest, but as uh, just a regular guy that shows up a lot more than, than I do. Uh, but thank you for all that you do for helping us. Uh, please visit our book table uh, on your way out. I uh, have three books out there. One, Master of Relationship, was a study of uh, relationships based on leadership, how Jesus discipled his disciples. The other is a young adult book, uh, The Power of Your Destiny, how to make important life choices and, and how to understand God's determined destiny for your life. 
The third book is something that I'm very excited about. Uh, just came out this year. You know, I have learned that we should never give up on our dreams. Sometimes dreams are born in early, the early seasons of our lives and yet do not come into fruition until the latter years. Uh, when I came to the Lord, I went to college and was so excited that I was no longer a D student. Amen. <laughs> you know, I made D's all through high school. I passed uh, algebra on the second attempt, and the only reason I passed was because the uh, instructor said, Look, I don't want you in my class again <laughs> next year. I'm going to let you go, but you don't deserve to pass. But you know, it's amazing how the Lord can redeem a person and even redeem their minds and their intellect. And so I did well in school. I was an English major, of all things, and uh, preparing for the ministry. Always wanted to write, uh, but I gave that up to, uh, for the sake of the work of the Lord, and I never really wrote what I wanted to write. So when I turned uh, 60, I thought, you know what, if I don't do it now, I never will. I've always had a dream of penetrating the secular world. And I believe that we should have that dream, that our task is not just to preach to one another, but to find a way to bring the message of our relationship with the Lord into the, into the world and into, in a way that's palatable to people. So I wrote a women's fiction. <laughs> Bel yeah, go figure. People say, wait a minute, you, you wrote, a, yep, uh, the guy that, that treks up into the mountains and sleeps on the ground, yep. Uh, people ask me, how did you do that? And I, say, I ask Beverly a lot of questions. <laughs> but, you know, it's one thing to write something. It's another thing then to, begin to get recognition. So this year uh, it was published. And this year I received five publishing awards. And uh, just this week I received an invitation to accept uh, the Mississippi Library Association's Fiction Book of the Year Award. Oh, yeah. Wow, Shazam, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to be in uh, Nepal in October when they do the banquet, so I won't be able to attend, but I'm sending Beverly to accept the award in my behalf. Now, independent publishers gave me a, a, a silver medal, and they sent me this. They got that in the mail two weeks ago. It's this great big medallion about this big, and it's got a blue ribbon on it. And I asked Beverly to wear my medallion when she gives it. She said, I'm not wearing that ridiculous thing. Uh, by the way, John Grisham won that award in 1992 for the firm. Just saying. <laughs> so we're excited about it. Obviously, you can tell I'm excited. Uh, sorry, guys, about the picture of the flower. You know, most guys don't read anyway, so I said, forget them. Forget them. Why do you think I wrote a woman's fiction, you know? If you can talk your husband into reading it, he'll love it. He'll absolutely love it. And maybe it'll teach him something about how to be kind uh, to you. It, I certainly learned a lot. Amen, Sister Beverly? All right. So visit that if you like, and uh, thank you for all you guys have done. Let's pray together, and we'll open God's Word this morning. Father, thank you for your Word that is powerful and life-changing, for that Word that brings inspiration to us and challenge to our lives. And Lord, as we open that word this morning and examine our hearts before it, may we be changed and challenged, and may we grow in our understanding of your intention for the church. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to teach you this morning about Paul, a legend of our faith, and really about apostles. Uh, you know, sometimes I believe that we misunderstand what it means to be an apostle. We have what we call in Mississippi a highfalutin understanding of that term. Uh, and really, if we hardly can find application of that term, we don't find anyone that walks around, uh, any credible person anyway, who walks around calling themselves an apostle. It just doesn't really fit in our, in our vernacular, in our culture, in our, in, in our church. Uh, but there is an office or there is this thing we call an apostle and something that we do need to understand. What does that mean and how does that apply? So I want to teach a little bit about that this morning. I so enjoyed uh, Jordan's message uh, last Sunday. I watched that when he taught on Joshua, another legend of our faith. 
And I liked his opening comments where he said, we often put legends on a pedestal. We often put them up there at this, at this position that's impossible to achieve. But he said, really, they were ordinary people just like us. They faced difficulties in life. And Paul, that great apostle who wrote 13 books of the New Testament, who is someone that we all admire and, follow, and pattern our lives after, he was also a difficult person, especially before he met the Lord. Now, even after he met the Lord, he was a little bit tough to deal with if you read his letters. But before he met the Lord, he was what we might call an angry elf. <laughs> you guys know what an angry elf is. <laughs> You know, he railed against Christians and persecuted Christians, murdered Christians. And the Bible describes in Acts the uh, people who stoned Stephen laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Paul. Paul was stubborn. He was religious. He was difficult to get along with. He, he was determined to destroy the name of Christ. The Lord had to appear to Paul personally and slap him off of his horse to get his attention. Now, my translation of that passage is something like this. Hey, Paul, what are you doing? You idiot. And Paul said, who is it that has slapped me off of my horse? And the Lord said, it's Jesus whom you are persecuting. That was his encounter, his introduction to Christ. Now, Beverly insists that he was not on a horse. She's done a study on it. She sent me the links to the study. Uh, you know, I said, okay, Bev, what, whatever. She says he couldn't have been on a horse because he was traveling uh, with his companions. And the Bible says clearly the companions were walking. They were traveling 150 miles. If he was on a horse traveling that distance, uh, he would have been ahead of his companions, not with his companions. So therefore, Paul was walking with his companions. And so I looked it up, and you know what? He wasn't on a horse. So I had one of those moments in my life when I had to say, Beverly, you're... <clears throat> you might be right. But uh, that was Paul. And uh, whether he was knocked off his horse or knocked to the ground, he was certainly on a high horse. And Paul went from serving religion to serving relationships. And this is where I believe our first misconception about apostles occurs. We think that the ministry is based on authority. And we think that an apostle is an authoritative person. But it's quite the opposite. Ministry is based on compassion and love and relationship. And if there is such a thing as an apostle... They should be the most loving, the most compassionate, the most humble, the most serving of all. How many of you understand? And so when we hear this word apostle, we have this wrong perception that we put him above rather than below. This is what I'm discovering about the ministry. The ministry always serves from the bottom. Jesus said, I have come and I have washed your feet as a servant to, to demonstrate to you uh, my service for you. Paul said, I'm the least of the brethren. He didn't mean this in some kind of boasting of false humility. He literally believed he was the least deserving of all those in the ministry in his day. And so Paul, who we call an apostle, did not have this kind of conception of himself as being an authoritative or powerful person, though he was. He was rather a person who saw himself as the lowest and the least of all and who was there to serve others. And so as we study about what does it mean to be an apostle, I want to try not to bring that person down to our level, but to bring ourselves up to that, to his level, and understand that all of us can do those kind of works of service. It is not something that is unattainable. All right, so we're going to look in our Bibles this morning in the book of 2 Timothy. And we'll stay in this passage the whole time, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 1. And I'm reading out of the uh, New Living Translation. And what I want you to see here is what apostles are. First of all, they are chosen and they are sent. They are chosen and they are sent. All right, read this verse with me. This letter is from Paul. 
chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. I have been sent out to tell others about the life He has promised through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, as we read this passage, we see this affectionate relationship that Paul had with this young man named Timothy. We don't find uh, Paul ordering Timothy or telling him what to do, but we find him expressing uh, these, uh, this language of compassion and sonship. We find that Paul had this kind of father uh, relationship and father attitude in the way that he related to people. But Paul, he said, Paul said, I have been chosen by the will of God. An apostle or anyone in the ministry is someone who literally the Lord Himself has chosen. And then He said, I have been sent out. Now, people have referred to me and even called me an apostle. I don't honestly think that I am, and I'm not trying to be falsely humble. I'm really not. But what I do is I do apostolic work. I have understood and studied the life of Paul and other apostles, and I have discovered a way that they go about ministry. And I have mimicked that kind of ministry. And I have found that I can, though I'm not an apostle, I can do apostolic things, even though that does sound a little bit highfalutin. <laughs> and when, as we look at this message this morning, you'll begin to understand what I'm talking about and see that you yourself can also do these sort of things, that you can serve others and help them to be a success in life. And this is really what Paul did. Sometimes we romanticize the ministry, and we think that it's something that it is not. Sometimes things don't always appear to be what they really are. I was in Islamabad a few years ago, walking with one of my leaders in the, in the city. We were in a market, and it was dusty, hazy that day, uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of smog. Uh, it had been very dry, dry season of the year. And off in the distance, I could see what appeared to be a, a car floating above the traffic. There were donkeys and cars going underneath that car, and here's this vehicle floating about eight feet off the ground, ten feet off the ground. I thought, what in the world is that? About maybe an eighth of a mile away. I asked my leader, I said, brother, what? can you see that? He said, yes, I'm seeing it now. It's very curious. <laughs> I said, what is that? He said, I, I don't know. And so we began to walk toward this apparition that appeared, you know, on the horizon. And as we got closer, he said, oh, now I am understanding. That is Pakistani tow truck. I said, what are you talking about? We got closer, and I found that this was an area where they were preparing for some kind of event, a political speech or something, and people had illegal, illegally parked. And so the police came with a forklift. And they were literally picking up cars on a forklift and moving them to an area where they were quarantining those cars. They actually placed them on top of a wall. The wall was about 10 feet wide, and you had to come and pay money to get your car off the wall. How's that for a system, you know? Brilliant. And so this Pakistani brother is with me. He said, oh, yes, now I'm understanding everything. This is very effective. However, your car can be very seriously damaged. <laughs> I thought, what, what kind of world am I in? So things are not always what they appear to be. And sometimes apostles, you know, we are not what, who you think they are. In fact, the word missionary does not even appear in the Bible. Did you know that? There's no such thing in the Bible for people who do what I do. In fact, there, there is no such thing as a missionary. Really, missionary simply means a sent one. So someone who goes on a mission is sent by someone else to do a mission. So a sent one of Christ Jesus is sent for a specific purpose. A sent one of the church is sent for a specific purpose. A missionary is really an apostle. Someone who is sent to represent the church. So it's not really as highfalutin as it sounds. In fact, we send the ones who are most dispensable to the places that are the most difficult. <laughs> That's why I don't get the big head. Because I know you guys are sending me to places like Pakistan and India and, you know, and Nepal and... Uh, 
You know, you, send, you would never send Pastor. Now, by the way, Pastor Van is coming in October. We finally talked him into coming to visit our work. Amen. I'm so excited. You know your pastor loves to sleep in his own bed. I might be sharing his secrets. Maybe not. Maybe you all know it, but I know it. He said, Brother Rick, I'd love to come, but I just like to sleep in my own bed. It's Pastor Van, come on. So we're excited about him coming. But see, see, here's the deal, though. You know Pastor Van is not dis dispensable. If, I, if something happens to me, well, you're going to get along just fine. You follow what I'm saying here? Now, Beverly may not make it too well, but you'll do just fine. So we don't get, you know, any sense of false importance. Just because I do this kind of work doesn't make me any more authoritative than anyone else in the ministry. Now, the Bible in Ephesians chapter 4 talks about the five uh, offices of the ministry, and it describes these offices as being gifts to the church. There's the apostle, the prophet, the pastor, the evangelist, and the teacher. And all of these offices, the Bible says, help to equip the church to do the work of the ministry. It is the church that actually does the work of the ministry, and the task of the ministry uh, offices are to equip and teach and train the church. That's what I'm doing here this morning. We rarely hear teaching about apostles. I'm helping you to understand it and understand that this is something that you can achieve to in your own life. And let me give you this example. Uh, your pastor, Pastor Van, is the pastor of this congregation. We all know that. Not one of us could fill his office. How many of you think you could be Pastor Van? No way. No, I could not be Pastor Van. I don't have the skills. I don't have the patience. I don't have the, the you know. <laughs> well, we'll move on there. Uh, I just don't have what he has. However, I can help to pastor people. I can do the work of pastoring. You may not be a pastor. You may not be recognized as a pastor. You may not be Pastor Van. But how many of you know, understand you can pastor someone? It's within your reach. Yes, we honor Pastor Van. Yes, we know we could never do what he does. But yet we recognize we can do things that function in a pastoral way. I'm not a great teacher like Larry Stockstill. I believe he's the best teacher in America. You, just, you can't beat his teaching. I never. I used to compare myself to him, and I would just want to quit. You know, forget it. I'll never teach like that. But I can do teaching. I'm teaching now. It's a lot simpler, but it's making sense to you, right? Uh, we can, I'm not an evangelist. You know, evangelists don't. I don't wear white shoes. I don't have any flash. You know, I can't tell any <laughs> funny stories. But every once in a while, and if the crowd is you know sympathetic, but. Uh, <laughs> I'm just, I don't have that, but yet I can evangelize. And in the same way, when we understand what it is an apostle does, we realize though we may not be apostles, and though we may not even want to be called that because it really is kind of strange, we can do this kind of work, and we can help uh, to advance uh, people, and leaders especially, through our ministry of being a sent one, chosen by Jesus Christ. How many of you following with me so far? So Paul had this kind of relationship with Timothy. Timothy was like his protege. Timothy was his young son in the ministry, or in the work. And his task as he went about his life was on the side to kind of develop Timothy as he went along the way. And that's simply really what, a, what an apostle does. We serve one another. Now, there can be many misunderstandings when you're serving someone. Sometimes you may do something having very good intentions and that it is misunderstood by the very person you're serving. Apostles often take this risk and, and take the, uh, with the understanding that I may be misunderstood when I serve someone else. I may even make mistakes in serving someone else. Uh, a few years ago, Beverly and I were in Nepal in our conference. And once, a, once every two years, we bring all the churches together and have a conference together. And there's a group of people there called the Tarus. And so a Taru brother was excited about serving us one of his traditional dishes, and he brought it to us and served it on a plate. 
Unfortunately, it was dark uh, when he gave me that dish. I had no idea what it was, but I knew he was happy about it and excited. So I dipped my hand. We eat with our hands there. I dipped my hand in the dish and put that food in my mouth and began to chew. It was delicious tasting, but it was crunchy. And so he had this look of horror on his face, but he didn't know what to say. So I took another bite, and I said, oh, it's delicious. And so finally, he couldn't stand it anymore, and he said, Pastor, you're not supposed to eat the snail shells. <laughs> you're supposed to... Oh, oh, oh. So I misunderstood his intentions. They were pretty good, though, to be honest. But they're little bitty snails, and because the sna the, they were so small, you could actually chew up the, the shells. So... <laughs> <laughs> so our task, we want to say, what, what does an apostle do? You know, let's boil it down. What's the simple thing they do? They're sent to serve. How, how hard can that be? I have been sent to serve someone else. So any one of us can do that if we understand we're sent, we're called by Jesus Christ, called into the, this thing we call the church, and that we are all assigned to do the work of an apostle. It's not an unachievable task for us to do. Anyone can serve someone else in the work of the Lord. You agree or disagree? So it's not a big deal, is it? It's actually a very simple thing. All right, second thing I want to show you is in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. He says, I'm writing to you, Timothy, my dear son, and may God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord give you grace and mercy and peace. I want you to see something here, that apostles are compassionate. They're, they're not rooted in authority. They're rooted in service. They're not rooted or built on command. They're built on humility. They are people of compassion. I have applied a mission message that is a little bit different missions method in that I find young men between 26 and 35 years of age, and I basically launch them into the ministry. I provide venture capital, I provide training, coaching, and I walk with them through the process. And many of you know my story, but over the last 15 years, Beverly and I have launched eight young men in the ministry. Deshaun De Silva, Colombo, Sri Lanka, right now is building a $400,000 building on his own with Sri Lankan resources. We planted him 15 years ago. Uh, Victor Nazareth, overseeing a region out of Delhi, about uh, 30 churches under his oversight. Uh, Ian uh, Hendricks, pastoring a growing congregation in Mumbai, India. Pastor Joseph in Aurangabad, India, now grown to about 400 believers. Uh, David, caring for our orphans in our children's home in Kathmandu. Safir, uh, planted eight churches in Pakistan and pastors a 1,500-member congregation. Pastor Shokat is building his first building right now. He's grown to 350 people in the last 18 months. With these eight men, together we are pastoring over 20,000 believers. Amen. <laughs> Do you know that building that did not require authority? It required humility, honesty, transparency, love, compassion. It was not a difficult thing. All I did was father those young men and love them and make them successful. It wasn't that hard. And I hardly used authority. I hardly commanded anyone. I just served as the least of the brethren. I can honestly say that I'm more satisfied at this stage of my life because I've learned to serve others than I have been in any other season of my life. I am content. I could walk away from the ministry today and be happy with what the Lord has given me. I'm not saying I want to. <laughs> Don't misunderstand me. But I have reached a place of satisfaction through serving. Number three... 2 Timothy chapter 1, still, verse 6 and 7. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and of self-discipline. People who serve people are apostles will change people. When you serve someone with the intention of promoting them into leadership, you change them 
through serving them. Jesus changed his disciples by serving them. Paul changed the New Testament church by serving that church. Your pastor has changed this city by serving this city, teaching and developing and serving you. This is the work of the ministry, and all of us can serve someone in some way and help them develop into leadership. I hope you understand, church, the gravity of our calling, the necessity of our compassion, the responsibility of our work. For each one of us must learn to carry someone in our hearts to the level that I've just described to you that we're willing to serve them and to lay our lives down in their behalf. Amen? Let's bow our heads together. You say, Pastor Rick, uh, you know, I get this. I've listened, I've heard, I've been touched. I've never really thought of myself as serving as an apostle. Never even considered that because it's something so high that I could never achieve. Do you say this morning I've realized, you know what? I can do any of these things in the ministry. I can be an apostle, a pastor, a prophet, teacher, evangelist in my realm of responsibility. You say, Pastor, I've been touched by this and I've decided that I want to respond to a higher calling of influencing others that I want to begin to pastor those around me, teach them, evangelize them, even be an apostle to them, to serve them, that I want to be sent by the Lord and called to a task, and I want to find someone that I can serve in the Lord. If that's you this morning, you say, Pastor, I'm not going to recognize you, call you forward, or do anything like that, or lay hands on you, but I will pray for you and ask that what's on me might also somehow be transferred into your life. If that's you this morning, just very quickly raise your hand. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Many, many hands went up, of course. You may say, Pastor, I feel that I want to do this, but I feel unworthy. I'm not right with God. I know my heart is unclean. There are things in my life that have caused me to be ashamed, and I could not imagine God even having an interest in using me. Uh, I, I just almost hopeless there because I feel unclean. But this morning, I have, I have this hope within me that maybe I can get right with God, and maybe God can use me. If that's you this morning, I'm not going to again recognize you, but I do want to pray for you, and I want to help you. You say, Pastor, I need to get right with God so that I can change myself, and in changing myself, then change others. If that's you, raise your hand quickly. Let me see it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Lord of the church, the shepherd of our souls, the master of all, may this congregation never forget what I have shared with them this morning. And may, Lord, those who have raised their hands and say, Lord, here am I, send me. May you choose them. May you call them. May you send them, and may, Lord, as I have discovered, they discover great satisfaction in the hand of the Lord in their lives, in fulfilling your will, in Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you, church. Thank Come you. Come on, let's give it up real quick. Yes. Thank you, Pastor. The decision to follow Christ is just the beginning of your relationship with God. So we'd love to help you with your next steps. If you'll go to northwood.tv slash connect and fill out the information, our lead pastor, Van Decody, wants to send you a letter that tells you some steps to take in order to maintain your new relationship with God. We'll also give you some information about Northwood Church. We are one church in multiple locations. We have a campus in Gulfport, Wiggins, and Long Beach. If you live in one of these areas, we'd love to see you at one of our services. You can visit our website, northwood.tv slash locations for service times and directions. If you'd like to give to this ministry, you can do that online as well. Just go to northwood.tv slash give. 
giving. You can give a one-time donation or you can sign up for our online community called MyNC and set up a recurring payment. Thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next time.